what's going on up there in the era of COVID. Uh, we'll be speaking live with the uh, president of Michigan State University and also uh, the head of the School of Nursing and the head of residential and hospitality, understanding what campus life is like in these very strange times uh, that we are in. In the meantime, you know, there was a conversation that we've been having that's been ongoing for the past several weeks about governor, uh, not governor, perhaps she has that aspiration though, <clears throat> it'd be Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson's desire to make sure that no one open carries near polling places. Well, a court of claims judge ruled on that. The, the ruling came down right after we signed off from Grand Valley State University. And the ruling was essentially that she does not have that power insofar as the judge ruled that it was an administrative rule that she handed down. And before you can do that, there are certain T's that must be crossed and I's that must be dotted. And Judge Christopher Murray basically said that she did not follow the proper course to lay out that rule. They have appealed that ruling, but for now, open carry is still permitted within 100 feet of the polling place. Now, I don't know of anybody that's encouraging this. In fact, we've had several of you that are law-abiding gun owners that have said, you know what, just because we can doesn't mean that we should. Uh, nevertheless, a victory of sorts, and coming up a little bit later in the broadcast, we'll kind of sort out whether this is a Second Amendment victory or whether this is merely kind of calling her out on a technicality, and maybe it's something that can be corrected before Election Day. Uh, nevertheless, the governor did have a news conference uh, at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, neither she, A.G. Nessel, nor the Secretary of State directly addressed this legal defeat that they sustained in the Court of Claims, but they did make it clear that they wanted to reassure voters that there would be an attempt to block any kind of voter intimidation. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But we want to bring in uh, our first guest, uh, and that is Randolph Rash, the Dean of the Michigan State University College of Nursing. Uh, dean Rash, Good to have you with us. I hope you got plugged in and that you can hear me okay. I can hear you okay, but can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. And We're so good. neither one of us have been bugged. Uh, <laughs> give me a quick status report on the demand for nursing jobs at this point and where you are at the College of Nursing, and has it changed the kind of skills that are being demanded in this era of COVID? I think the demand for nursing is as strong or stronger than ever. And one of the things that we have seen, and we're a little concerned about, but one of the things that we have seen is that many individuals are seeing this coronavirus and COVID-19 as a time to stand up. They see it as a call to action. So we've actually seen some increases in our um, enrollment. We keep a uh, good, uh, good look at that, but we've seen that. In terms of what it's required to be a nurse, I think one of the things that uh, may be a misunderstanding in the pandemic environment is that nurses are educated and trained to care for patients. And some of those patients have infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. And often you don't know that they have the disease before. So if you remember during the Ebola outbreak, which wasn't really an outbreak, but over in Dallas, it was nurses who first identified something is going on here and they hadn't they listened to them too lately too late but um but just in time so the what is required for nursing care is essentially what was always required the additional pieces that our graduates and our colleagues who are in practice really have to look at patients and recognize that many times our patients have conditions and the first piece of people that see them our nurses and to speak up and say, I'm seeing something that's going on here, pay attention. You know, one of the things that is the silver lining or maybe the blessing in disguise with COVID is the uh, growing appreciation for the skills and the commitment of nurses and the sacrifice. And I think that has been really one of the silver linings here. So if, for someone that's considering a career in nursing, why Michigan State? Oh, wow. So I'm from Michigan originally, and I'd only gone through uh, religious schools. One of the big attractions to me about Michigan State University when this opportunity came along is Michigan State University is, is amazing because it's not only here to educate the citizens of the state. As a land-grant university, it is here to serve the citizens of the state. So for nursing, 
We are already educating our graduates to care for individuals, for families and populations. But when you finish, the track record for our state, for our, our alums is that 85% of the graduates from Michigan State University stay in the state of Michigan. And I think it says something about why they select us because they see what our commitment is. The, the great thing about Michigan State University, I would say, is the support for students. Uh, like I said, I came through religious schools. This is a large institution. I think we have like 60,000 students, but I always say to potential students and their families, come visit, because when you get to the campus, Yes, there are that many students, but it doesn't feel that way. It feels like you can know each other, you can know the faculty, you can know and you can develop community. So as large as it is, it has that small town feel. And I came from a very, very small town in Michigan, so <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's 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 a wonderful thing. I've only got a couple of seconds left, but but very quickly. Talk to me about the rewards of nursing, because I know we've seen a lot of very stressed out nurses on the TV news recently with COVID. Make sure that we throw a little bit more weight on the other side of the scale and that this is a rewarding profession. Well, I think some of the things that we see have been hearing in the news are really a call to care for nurses. But the call for nurses and the reward for nursing, and I have to say, one of the things for me is I have been so grateful to have chosen this career what you get in providing care for patients and their families and seeing great outcomes in health care, seeing the transition for when folks come to the point that they are dying, that you can die healthy, that health is something that we are entitled to as human beings and there are various phases of it. But nurses get to be with families, get to be with yeah. patients at those critical times when you really know why you're there because you hear it from them. It's such a great, rewarding career. It's so funny because in the times when my parents have been hospitalized, it is the nurses that we dealt with that left the most lasting impression and lasting memories. And what? you know, and that's and I think that speaks to the, the level of care that they bring to their jobs. Doctor Rush, we're out of time, but our Dean Rush, I yeah. just I just made you a doctor. You got an MD. I, Put it after well, your name. I Dr. am doctor. D I am doctor. D you I are have a PhD in nursing. PhD. Yeah. Uh, well, Dean Raj, thank you so much, and we hope that folks will consider the School of Nursing as they're considering new professions and upscaling their uh, uh, upscaling their skills. Thanks so much. Hey guys, thanks for having me. I appreciate it very much. Much more ahead from the college tour, but we will look ahead at Governor Whitmer's news conference today. What she said her biggest fear is when asked if the election will be a super spreader event. The answer surprised me. Maybe it'll surprise you, too. Let's get to uh, Michael Stetz in the meantime. WJR Traffic first. Thank you very much, Guy. WGR Traffic First, sponsored by Reamer Floors. National Care Stand Month is happening now at Reamer Floors. Lowest okay. prices of the season, 36-month financing and an instant rebate up to $1,000 on Care Stand carpet, hardwood, and luxury vinyl floors. Visit ReamerFloors.com to schedule your shop at home or in-store appointment. In the city on 375 Allison. southbound between Larned Street and Jefferson Avenue. Good to that have part you with us. Closed right now until early years. November bless for emergency bless pavement you, repair. You. Thanks Expect so delays. much. In Oakland County, traffic moving and slowly is, right now on true, 75 it, northbound that, between 696 and 11 miles. Yes, you know, and in St. Clair County, a disabled vehicle is blocking the right shoulder right now on 94 eastbound after crash at road. Now WJR weather first from the Weather Channel. Well, Hurricane Zeta charges towards the Gulf Coast uh, late today, and uh, big cold fronts continue to uh, throw their weight around across the Great Lakes. High pressure in charge today. We're in the low 50s, low tonight, 40 degrees, but another fast-moving system in tomorrow. There you are. I'm here. I was always here, just uh, just Lur listening. lurking in the background. Lurk, working in the background, not lurking, working. Um. Okay, so sorry that was such a rocky thing um what happened to my notes from this doggone there we go yeah no i i, I thought you got into that smoothly all right yeah well there wasn't exactly an, a, an easy transition um the um i gotta just look over some of this um this thing here because some of these bites i don't remember it's been two hours i don't remember what they were now the context of the, some of them from benson Hi to Mark, Allison, Jerry. Thanks for finding us. A lot of uh, praise being heaped on on nurses. Yeah, good to see that.
And you're right, guy. I remember uh, one time when a, a family member of mine was in the hospital, went into, uh, I don't know exactly what the episode was, but it was pretty traumatic. And the nurses were just in there doing their job. They're almost like superheroes with that type of life-saving stuff. Just another day at the office for them. You know, it's it, it, it was funny. And, you know, we, and we were facing with my dad a lot of challenges because they couldn't seem to get his meds right. And, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes things get a little, you know, it, it's funny because the, the nurses seem to have a better, better handle on things than the doctors did in a lot of, because the doctors aren't there to see how the patient reacts to the drugs that you're giving them, right? Right, exactly. And it was driving us more than a little crazy. They put my dad on Oxy for pain relief, and it turned him into, I thought he had Alzheimer's. I thought he completely lost his mind. Right. And I mean, they, you, you need to, I, I mean, obviously... You don't have to have all the, the PhDs, but you have need to have almost as much medical knowledge as the doctors. Uh, I, I think he's trying to uh, remember the context of the... Well, I'm just trying to rem- get him in the right order here. Um, so I'm probably going to go to cut seven first, Michael. Okay, seven first. Well, actually, one and then seven probably. Okay. So William's asking. Uh, we're about a minute twenty away. William's asking if there's a nurse nor, nursing shortage in Michigan. Mark Gardner, one of our regulars, says his son-in-law just started the nursing program, and the demand for nurses is sky high right now, which yeah. would make sense. It's and it's you know we've seen it especially in in the rural, just like the, with docs. It's in the rural hospitals where they have some of the biggest shortages. Right. And the other thing that was really interesting, and this happened just in the past few days, Henry Ford Hospital announced that their entry-level jobs are going to be a $15 minimum wage. So they Good. gave, they, they gave their great. entry-level people a big bump, and that gives you an idea about the, the shortage is that it's driving up wage rates. So it's there, there right. is a, a, a supply and demand issue there. Well, I would imagine just with, with the COVID, um, you, you know, the, the demand for nurses would be sky high because you need to staff the – you need to staff the floors and the, the, the hospital wards that have nurses out because they were sick as well. Exactly. Here we come in eight seconds here. All righty. The stories that have been breaking while you've been at work. 760 WJR, where Detroit comes to talk. And we will be celebrating all things Spartan. And again, we've got a big game coming up this Saturday, Michigan-Michigan State. Uh, It's always a huge social event. Probably not as much this year, though I know some people that are having parties. Either way, we hope it's a great game. And as you know, I got no skin in the game. I live with a couple of Wolverines. Uh, I got a ton of Michigan State friends. My father-in-law is a Michigan State guy. So I root for everybody. I'm Switzerland. I just want I, whoever whoever wins. I just don't want some poor kid to be the goat. Uh, as we told you, a Michigan judge striking down Secretary of State Benson's uh, gun ban at the polling place. It is important to understand what this ruling was, but also what it wasn't. The judge says it is important to recognize that this case is not about whether it is a good idea to openly carry a firearm at a polling place or whether the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution prevents the Secretary of State's directive. It's not about that. It's whether she kind of stepped outside the lines and instituted an administrative rule or administrative law without going through the proper process. He said that there was a big question about that, and so the injunction was granted on behalf of the gun groups that filed suit, and also Robert Davis, who you probably know is kind of a legal gadfly in town, and and (laughs) filed suit over all kinds of things. And while not exactly addressing their defeat in the courts, uh, whether it was Secretary Nessel, excuse me, A.G. Nessel, Secretary Benson, or Governor Whitmer, they all had the same thing to say. They want to make sure that Michiganders understand that when they go to the polls, if they go to the polls on Election Day, 
that it will be a safe and comfortable environment. And Governor Whitmer went so far, and we're going to apologize in advance for the audio here. It was before they had their stream fixed. But basically laid out what is and is not voter intimidation. This is what the governor had to say. Cut one, Mike. Examples of voter intimidation include people who are not poll workers asking for documentation, photographing or videotaping voters, disseminating false or misleading election information, directly speaking to or questioning voters, and blocking the entrance to a polling place. So those are all voter intimidation infractions that can be punished. Do you notice what she didn't say? She never said that openly carrying a firearm was voter intimidation, and it isn't. Uh, in fact, as we told you, and I'll hold it up here for those that are viewing on Facebook, this is a situational awareness bulletin. Uh, this is a document that is disseminated to law enforcement agencies. We became in possession of it because one of our fine friends in law enforcement said, in this, the Michigan State Police and the Michigan uh, Intelligence Operations Center for Homeland Security say very explicitly, while technically not violating the law, open carry could intimidate potential voters. So they say right here, it's not against the law. Nevertheless, uh, the Secretary of State wanted law enforcement to act like it did. Nevertheless, uh, Attorney, Nessel, Attorney General Nessel said that there will be law enforcement in polling places, not necessarily on the grounds, but they will be on call and nearby. Here's what she said about the fact, of, which is, by the way, she filed an appeal on this today, and they hope to have this cleared up by Election Day. Here's what she said about law enforcement and whether or not she will see this in force. Cut seven. Irrespective of the outcome of that case, uh, the fact is we know that the polls will be safe and secure. Uh, we don't intend to have law enforcement at the polls. We don't usually do that. Uh, we're not going to do it this year, but they will be um, nearby in the event that there are any sorts of issues whatsoever. And again, um, you can always contact my office. I'll provide that number one more time. 517-335- 7659. But I should say this, we are not expecting to have any problems at the polls. Uh, this was merely an additional precaution that the secretary decided to take um, based on the fact that, you know, there were poll workers and clerks and voters that had voiced some concern. But any way you look at it, we're going to make sure that everyone knows exactly what the rules are prior to November 3rd. Uh, and we're going to make certain that everyone feels safe and has a, a pleasant voting experience. So there are two things happening here that I find interesting. One, uh, you heard that Governor Whitmer basically admitted that open carry is not voter intimidation in her uh, statement there. And A.G. Nessel says there, yeah, th there isn't a concern. We don't have a, a verifiable threat here. And she downplays the threat of voter intimidation, but she said, you know, it had been expressed by some clerks, by some voters, and that's what they were responding to. So basically, they heard from some, I don't want to diminish their concerns, but they heard from some worry warts, they responded, and what they did was they kicked a hornet's nest that didn't need to be kicked. Because now we are seeing some things where folks are saying, you know what, if they say I can't, I'm going to open carry just to prove my point. Well, now that they've won in court, hopefully that won't be the case. Uh, Secretary Benson also had something I thought important to say about battling misinformation. They're already seeing it online, people trying to undermine faith in Michigan system. In Michigan, we have paper ballots. We can do recounts. We have a hard copy record. Uh, so the chance for fraud here is much less great than in areas where maybe they rely on digital voting. This is what she had to say about the responsibility that all of us have in reporting that kind of misinformation and also in making sure that we don't share it, that we don't spread the fire and the dis and misinformation that may be out there. Cut three, please, Mike. When the false attacks on our elections will increase, I have no doubt that we'll see an increase in the rhetoric that has, that has poured into our states and other states from around the country and from around the world. The misinformation attacks have just one goal, to ensure or attempt to ensure that voters doubt the legitimacy of our election but they will not succeed. The same spirit that drives 
the 1600 election clerks that are carrying out elections with the highest of ethical standards, the spirit that prompted more than 30,000 Michigan citizens to send uh, their support and sign up to be election workers this year. Amidst a global pandemic, this spirit is present in far too many Michigan citizens to be overcome by lies and scare tactics. And she went through the process, and I thought it was important that she did that, pointing out that in the counting places, there are challengers from both parties who will oversee this process and have the ability to cry foul if they see something wrong. And that after the fact, the board of canvassers will certify the vote. And on that board, both parties are represented. And these are, in many cases, people that are old hands at this. They know what to watch out for, and they know the legitimate challenges to make. And there's two things that are important about that. They're not the kind of people that are going to raise a fuss in a partisan way. They are professionals. And I think that helps to restore some of the faith or concerns about faith in our election system. We'll have those cuts for you as well, but we also invite your comments on the Court of Claims decision that uh, went in favor of the, the gun groups that said you can't infringe upon the right to carry with an order from the Secretary of State. She's out of her lane. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. 1-800-859-0957, 1-800-859-0WJR, and more from our friends at Michigan State University. But first, Michael Stetz, WJR Traffic First. All right. In Port so Huron, got... delays up to 30 minutes for trucks right now on the Blue Water Bridge heading eastbound. In Oakland County, tra- uh, Guy? Yes, ma'am? I am going to reorder as we get closer or just give you an update on callers. Also, I have a very random question for you. Mm-hmm. When you're on a Word document and you need to, um, if you've got columns, how do you get to the second column? shift over Do you, here's you know what it's been i don't use word that much i use pages because i'm a mac guy so i can't tell you because i'm really having an issue i wouldn't be surprised if someone out there uh, watching us on facebook might know the command <laughs> you do, and they can answer me You'd be for all people. For those of you that are on Windows computers, could you tell us what the hell we do with this Microsoft Word document? We're on a Google Doc because I tried it there too. If you know how to help Laura with columns, you can fill in host next time Guy is off. I'm trying to make our guest sheet for election night, and the way that I formatted it last maybe hold. Time is- very no, no, I can't hold up my document. I was well, I was gonna say maybe if there's a phone number, block it off or whatever. There's a lot of phone numbers, I can't block. Oh, them. oh, all right. Well, everyone, use your imagination. But it was um really easy. Well, we got till election night to figure it out. No, I need to get this done today. Oh, wow. I don't know where Laura is going to have time to do this with our War of the Worlds presentation tonight. Well, yeah, we got to let our Facebook friends know about that. We've got a big uh, radio drama kicking off tonight. We're going to be re- a reproduction of the War of the Worlds with WJR <laughs> talent, <laughs> in quotes. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't want to. I, I don't want to say all of who's in there, but uh, it's cool. We've got Blaine and Lauren from ninety six three joining us. Kind of a company-wide uh company-wide uh production here and uh yeah everyone's going to be doing it from home so there's going to be a whole bunch of camera shots a whole bunch of uh opportunities for me to mess up so i would say for that suspense alone it's worth uh worth tuning in um i want to do cut four uh and cut five okay here you're going to call for him? Yeah. Okay. Actually, if you want to come in with cut four. Sure. That'll be fine. Um, just, and if you have it handy, we've got the Perna read after Kenny here. Oh, so, uh, yep. 
And obviously we can't hear Ke- – I mean, I can hear Kenny, so I'll just kind of keep you updated here. I will wait for the magic uh, cue there. Wait till I give you the finger. This one. Instead of just telling me that I'm number one. <laughs> Yeah, so Mike, to, for for those that are watching on Facebook, Michael is. Are you an associate producer, a technical director? Rich Lazinski. Rich Lazinski is the executive producer of the Poobah of Poobahs, but well, we're co-executive producers. He's running all the sound. I'm running all the video. Okay. Well, yeah, that's the fun of it. Again, for those of you that enjoy watching all the shenanigans backstage on these these things, um, you can watch us doing the the radio drama and. Got to say, Professor Pearson uh, really has ex- the, the, the Cam has exceeded himself in terms of uh, dressing the part. I'm still trying to figure out what I can do. I may I may have to put up a green screen here so that I can uh, <laughs> put an observatory behind me for my role. Yeah, I mean we kind we kind of have that as our background. All right, I we were talking, so I, I'm playing a spot here, and then then what'll happen is you'll come in, do your read, and then we'll. Then I'll give you music back. But all right, so we both missed our cues. Yeah, well, you know, we weren't paying attention. If Laura wasn't so busy uh, right now, she would be screaming at us. Did I lose Bill from Detroit? Uh, looks like you did. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's just as well. Yeah, but I, we did a run through on Saturday. Everyone was really was even more fantasticer than I thought they were going to be. So it'll be it'll be a fun watch. Now, Paul W. His his uh, read was stentorian no either laura's really excited about paul w or she figured it out i figured it out she's doesn't seem like anyone was worried she's now an ms word good aficionado Um, all right ready control shift enter in case five seconds and laura you won the uh sweepstakes to co-host for guy when he's out there you go putting you up Are you worried if this is the right time of year to sell your home? Well, now's the time to call Michael Perna. Judy had just lost her husband, and she was looking to downsize by selling their family home in Farmington Hills. She spoke with Michael and shared just how difficult it is to part with the home she built with her husband. Well, Michael's compassion and his empathy and also his attention to Judy's needs made this very difficult decision just so much easier. He wanted her to get the most money possible, so he implemented a marketing strategy that really worked. Two days after the listing, there were nine offers, and Judy's home sold for $10,000 over asking price. And she could now move on and purchase the condo that she wanted. And she could do it with the peace of mind and without having the heartache worsened that she was already going through. Well, you know Michael Perna. I've talked with you about him before. He's with Keller Williams Realty. He guarantees to sell your home at a price and a deadline that you agree to or he will buy it. And as Judy found out, he's just a good guy. And he will sell your home in one-third the time that it takes most realtors an incredible market average of just 17 days. Do yourself a favor. Call Michael Perna at 844-737-6276 or go online at thepernateam.com. And start packing. Welcome back to more Guy Gordon on WJR. Today, Guy is sponsored by Michigan State University. Visit them online at msu.edu. Once again, on his 2020 college tour, here's Guy Gordon. It will take time to process and tabulate every absentee ballot. Remember that our clerks can't begin that tabulation until 7 a.m. on Election Day. But once that moment hits, rest assured, they will be in earnest, methodically and securely tabulating every ballot, every valid ballot, and ensuring that every absentee ballot, once validated, is, t- is counted by a pair of election workers, one from each major political party who are trained to count together without political bias. An important point to make, this is a bipartisan process that goes on behind the scenes. And she went on to say, and after that part of the process is done, there is another bipartisan process that's initiated. Cut five. And then even after the counting is done, which could take until Friday in some jurisdictions, boards at the county and state levels that are comprised also of people from both parties will review the procedures, evaluate the counts of the entire election prior to the results being certified as official. 
It's uh, Jocelyn Benson, the Secretary of State, who we said earlier lost in court over her ability to ban open carry near polling places, within 100 feet of polling places. I read you the, uh, the important quote from the judge. Want to know what you think of this now? What do you think that uh, it will lead to? Maybe more, not voter intimidation, but more people to open carry. We've heard from law enforcement that said, you know what, this was a solution to something that was in search of a problem and that it actually may have caused more strife, more conflict, just because she was stirring a pot that didn't need it. Let's go to Troy, who's called in from Olivet. Troy, good afternoon and welcome to the show. Your lead hitter. Good afternoon, Guy. How are you doing? I'm excellent, sir. I, Thank I you. A, Beautiful day. I, I got a couple things. Um, right out of the gate, you guys just reported that there was 500 ballots that got lost in Detroit. That needs to be investigated because I'm curious as to where they came from, how they even know that they're lost. Right. I mean, at what point did they get lost? And if we find them, are they going to conveniently all be one party or the other? Well, um, secondary, one second. You, you want me to answer the question? I've got the answer to, to, to your second question, which yeah. is they, they were notified. You can find out online at Michigan.gov forward slash vote the status of your absentee ballot. So these were people that knew that they had mailed back their ballots. It appears to be a postal problem. The postal inspector is investigating along with uh, the Detroit city clerk. So right now there's no, there's no kind of air of skullduggery. It appears they're lost in the mail, and we've known this has been going. We've got a problem with the mail right now. So, and we know that the, the delays are the reason why uh, the Secretary of State came out today and said, whatever you do, don't mail your ballot. Bring it in to a secure drop location or vote in person on Election Day. Go ahead, Al, Troy. Sure. So fair enough. So second point is this. I don't I mean, the whole idea of uh, uh, the secretary of state and the gun ban was ridiculous and it's still ridiculous. So they're going to appeal it. I mean, here's what I don't get, guy. When we did the primaries, they didn't even enforce, which at the time they had the complete ability to enforce because uh, the Michigan Supreme Court had not ruled against the governor's executive orders. Why were masks not required for the primaries? And are they going to be required for the other election? Because what I'm thinking is she's going to now put on the fear tactic of please don't go vote because you're going to get the COVID after they've got all the Democratic votes mailed in early. Okay, so what she did say was this, and and it, and it was interesting. She was asked, are you worried about this election becoming a super spreader event? And she, she said, no, there's another event that I'm worried much more about, and I'll play that for you in a moment. But she said, and this was interesting, if you do have concerns about COVID, go and go to your clerk's office now and vote, or go and pick up an absentee ballot, then drop it in a secure drop box. Um, you know, she wasn't spreading fear, but she was saying, if you do have those fears, by all means, don't go. Vote, by all means vote. But we've got a number of different ways you can still do that, which I think was the responsible thing for her to say. It was interesting, though. This is what she had to say about what her big super spreader fear is, and it wasn't the election. Cut nine, please, Mike. I have a lot of concerns going into this election, not necessarily about the election itself, but all of the activities that are going to happen between now and this election. We have a Michigan-Michigan State game. As you can see, I've got my Spartan pin on and my Michigan mom pin on. Um, I can't lose in this one. However, we all lose if we drop our guard now, stop wearing our masks and start spreading COVID and have big parties and events around the game. We can watch football. I know lots of people were concerned about whether or not we could do that. We are here because of the work that we have done and because we have worn masks and we push our numbers down, but they are very concerning right now. And so I encourage people to be smart, to keep our wits about us, wear the masks, don't host a big event. Sit and watch your game, have the Zoom call on, crack a beer, enjoy it, but stay safe. So it was interesting. She didn't say that she thought the election was a big concern because it's limited contact, right? And to your question, Troy, about why are they uh, appealing this ruling when I think to most of us it's pretty clear cut, including to most in law enforcement who said we can't enforce this, it's not a law, um, the reason is, They're protecting their turf. They're protecting their power. They have to do it reflexively because that's they just got to, okay? It doesn't make sense to me either. I think it is a fool's errand. Uh, Let's go to Keith and Taylor. You take care, Troy. Uh, Keith, your thoughts on all of this? 
I think it's just a, a, another is more fear mongering by Democrats that they always talking about voter suppression, voter intimidation. It's just one of those things. And you took the words right about. I was thinking the same thing when you said it's the solution, looking for a, a, a problem to solve, and it wasn't a problem there. But I think the real concern was for me of uh, uh, voter fraud with these all these mail in ballots. And I remember the GOP was trying to strengthen the deterrent against that by making it a felony for anyone who got caught uh, foraging or you know fraudulently. Uh, signing ballots, mailing in or ballot right. harvest, you know, things like that, which the governor refused to sign. I think that that's something that should have been signed because it is a way of making sure that our election process is uh, transparent and fair. And, and, you know, we know that there are outside actors trying to uh, ha- uh, influence our election. So it's, the gun thing is just nonsense. But yep. It it, re- it really was. It was a battle that ne- didn't need to be fought. And when you listen to A.G. Nessel, she's very clear. She was minimizing her concern about it because they don't have a verified threat, that this was basically just to calm some folks down. It was the wrong way to go about it. And, and she said, and this is good, she said, you know what? We're not worried about it. We're going to have a safe election. I think that's the appropriate message to send at this point. But then it begs the question, why are you bothering to appeal? Uh, We'll get back with more of your calls when we come back. What life is like on a Michigan State dorm in the era of COVID, what they're doing to control it, and what they're going to do looking forward. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, WJR Traffic with Michael Stetz. Oh, Ron Sneed had an answer for you, Laura. You just go to Bing.com because that is the Microsoft um, search engine. And they'll give you, they would have answered your question. But, oh, you already did thank him. Thanks, Ron. She, and she ended up figuring it out. That was pretty cool. Did you figure it out using Ron's method, Laura, or did you do it on your own? Hey, Laura, did you figure it out using Ron's method or did you learn it on your, your own? Your mic's off. There we go. Yeah, you freak. You know, it's so funny. We get this is and this is going to be a big thing. This antitrust thing with Google is that you forget that there are other search engines that are pretty good, and I think Bing is in some cases a lot better. I actually like um, Bing's uh, satellite view better than Google's satellite view. Also, sometimes for fun, Laura and I like to map out the calls we get um, during the show just to kind of see like what our radius is. And um, on Google, you can only map 10 locations. On Bing, you can do unlimited locations. So hmm. it was yeah, we've interesting. Had some... Go ahead. Oh, I said we've had some good days. We've had some days where we had calls from West Branch down to Toledo, all the way out to Kalamazoo, out to Ontario. So it's fun to kind of. Oh yeah, that that was a, a highlight for me. So it's fun to see to see a map of where our callers call in from every day. When uh, when my son Whitson was was editing was the editor in chief at Lifehacker, they had a huge problem with Google because Google. There were people that were like, they had bots that would constantly Google the same article to try to get a certain website's articles to ping higher on a search. Oh, wow. And there's so many people that have learned how to scam Google to get their returns higher other than buying ads, right? And so, I mean, they were watching, Is they were the experts on certain things involving um, smartphones, but their articles were getting forced down in the list because the guys that were kind of not playing by the rules were boosting their own hits. Wow. I wonder how much a bot like that costs or a, a program like that costs. I don't know, but it, you know, there's, there's, you would think that Google would be able to spot cheaters. You would, and, and it was an ongoing fight between his website and Google and, and it ended up being, and there were some things that his publisher could have done to fix it, but wouldn't do it. So. Right. Well, you probably also have to stay one step ahead. Because the thing, the thing about scammers is they're very, uh, they're very cutting edge. Yeah. By the way, you'll see I am wearing a green pen. 
I, I'm, I'm using a green pen today. I was going to say, if you're I'm, wearing a pen, you're doing, you're using well, it wrong. If I was wearing my pen, who would know? <laughs> right. Let's see. Uh, looks like we have Venny Gore checking in. Mr. Gore, can you hear us, and can we hear you? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Sounds good. Perfect. He's even wearing his fancy Nike logoed merchandise today. Hey, good for you. Know, you. No, just for you guys. I decided that I would sparty up here. You okay. Know. Can you see my apparel today? Yeah, I like the green and white stripe, man. I okay. think that's really good. You know, the question is, do I look like a slender candy cane or just a very large breath mint? You know, you, know, uh, you look like whoever you want to look like, so I'm, I'm good with that. Benny, your eyes are better than mine. I would have guessed that was blue. It's like that dress that was all over the internet, you know, what color? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's how you go viral. Yeah. So before we go on, Benny, how many um, – how many students do you have in, in the residence halls now in terms We're, of the undergrads? Yeah, our, our um, on-campus population is about 2,500, including apartments. So that's about where we are on campus. And what would, what would, in terms of percentage of capacity, what would that be? 18, 18%. Just 18%. Just 18%. We normally would have about fifteen to 16,000 students with parents and with uh, student families and all combined in a okay. normal year. Yeah. This, well, I'll get into this into the interview, but I got to, I've got to imagine that in some ways it makes it easier and I, in other ways it makes it harder because um, in terms of vendors and things like that, I got to imagine that that uh, creates some problems. It, it, it has. Um, it's been a, a really uh, interesting year. Uh, I, I don't know what to call it. <laughs> so. We're back in 15 here, guys. So, okay. So I'll go. <laughs> the Guy Gordon Show, 760. Detroit. It is hump day, and it's a big green and white hump in this case. This is the uh, 2020 college tour on WJR. We have uh, virtually visited with our friends at Wayne State. We actually went out to Allendale and visited with our friends in person at Grand Valley State University. Uh, but today it's all about Michigan State, and uh, again, it is online and virtual as much of what they're doing at Michigan State is now. We're joined uh, by Venny Gore. He is the Senior Vice President for Residential and Hospitality Services uh, up in East Lansing. Venny, good to have you with us. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. So you're running just a little bit shy of 20% capacity in the residence halls. When when you started to ramp up, it, it doesn't matter how many you have, you still have to address the idea of infection control. So give us an idea of, of how you've mitigated that and whether or not come winter semester, you think you can invite more kids back on campus. So, uh, Gordon, thank you for this. Um, we have students living in single rooms in a uh, suite style. So they have their own room, their own bathroom. And we have found that that's been able to mitigate any transmission, which has been really good. And that's one of the things we wanted to find. So uh, our transmission on campus is 0.2%. So it's extremely low. Um, which is good. We're able to, we're using the Kellogg Center right now as our um, isolation housing. So mm -hmm. that if someone gets sick, we're able to move them over there and keep them uh, safe and keep the community safe. So it looks like we're going to be able to bring about 2,600 more students back on campus for spring. That's that's terrific news. And, th <laughs> and thus far, in terms of hearing from them, they're eager to do that and parents are okay with this, given the, the proof of concept that you folks have done. Yep. Yep. And in fact, I'm uh, going to be on a parent virtual conversation with them tonight at seven. And so we'll be talking with a bunch of parents and this will be the, the big question is, is uh, how safe is it for my son or daughter coming back? And, and I'll be able to share that with them and all the good things we've been doing. We've learned a lot over the last seven weeks. I'm sure um, you have. Yep. So it's been good. <clears throat> so have you learned enough to keep the parties from going crazy before the Michigan, Michigan State game? <laughs> because that's... <laughs> I mean, this is the biggest social event on campus, usually in, in a normal year, right? Yeah, in a normal year, uh, there would be 75,000 people in the stadium and 75,000 people outside the stadium, as you can recall. East Lansing, when the game is here, it's just 
just a big buzz and it has a lot of uh, things going on. And even Oh, yes, you, there is a big buzz, Vinny. I remember. <laughs> there, is a, there is a big buzz. And, I killed a lot of cells getting that big buzz years ago. Yes. And, and so it, it will be different. Um, it'll be really different here. And, and I sent out a correspondence to students and basically saying, I know that you're going to want to get together with your with your friends. And this is how you do it. Have 10 of your friends together, spread out, you know, have everybody bring their own picnic stuff. And so they don't spread the virus and do those things. And so, uh, you know, we're hoping that this will be a good, safe game that will be fun for everybody. Yeah, we, we do too. And I got to tell you, I, I want you to give you a chance to toot your horn. I did a story, had to be four or five years ago now, and I still was a reporter with Channel 4, about the fact that no other university in the state of Michigan is better at moving their students up the social mobility ladder than Michigan State University. Taking a low-income kid, moving them up the higher ladder. A middle-income kid, moving them up. And a lot of that is done because of the attention that they are given when they come in as freshmen in the dorms, that especially kids that might have been from challenged circumstances have the support when they get there. Tell me how you're doing that and why that kind of sets you apart. So, you know, we're a land grant institution and, and, you know, access is real important. So we have students who are first generation. In fact, I was just on another call with a woman who um, came from a small community outside of Owasso, first person in her family to uh, to go to college, and her parents were uh, were dairy farmers, and how that had impacted her life, and uh, she since stayed at the university and gotten her degrees here, and has gone on and do wonderful things. And so the, I think the residence hall system at Michigan State is really special, and it's hard for me to to understand why. Uh, I had worked at the University of Washington. I was at Illinois. I was at Wisconsin. Um, I did my undergrad work at South Carolina and uh, and at, did my grad work at Indiana. And uh, for a number of years, uh, the residential community is really special uh, because we have faculty and we have staff that are here to help students um, be really engaged. The neighborhood concept, we bring uh all of the support services into the neighborhoods. Right. You just don't have to go out to get a, you know, to get those access to those services. And, and what it does, it, it makes people feel at home. Uh, we know that the first semester is the most important semester. So we wrap a lot of services around that first semester. So Well, and, and that's the semester when you can lose the most kids, where they either the life skills uh, have thrown them off the rails, uh, you know, just learning to get up in the morning and get to class, or if they have an ac- academic speed bump, uh, you've got in the residence halls and between the academic administration, you've got this intercession so that they can, you've got people ready like you would in a neighborhood yeah. to intercede on behalf of that young person to make sure that, that they get back on track. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's really important is that uh, they have that contact with individuals between our RA staff, academic advisors, really to help students provide that safety net. Um, and I think, you know, normally about this time of the year for many freshmen, they're having their first um, experience with, finals and uh, midterms and papers and everything and they may have been their their smartest person in their school and now they've come to a place where everybody's just as smart as they are you know and so that's all the important things of it so in in terms of the uh we we know that there is like an ongoing battle and i I gotta lose you here in 90 seconds but there's an ongoing battle between universities to make those living accommodations uh, I wouldn't call it plush, but certainly more inviting than when we were students. Yeah. Uh, also, you know, workout rooms, things like that. Has that kind of scaled back a little bit? Or do you find that when you're competing for students, that's still top of mind for a lot of young people? Well, I think what's top of mind for folks is, do can I uh, have a sense of connection? And so that's what we try to do. The other thing that's top of mind to students is food. And, um, you know, we do about 50,000 meals a day. And, and so um, in doing the food and making it available and making it fresh, those things are real important. They make up for that 10 by 15 small room that people live in. So that makes a big difference. It, people well, make a big difference too. 
I think for parents, food is top of mind too. When we send a kid there, we want to know that they're going to get a, a, a decent meal and and have a you know and, and a balanced meal. Though that doesn't always work out. Yeah. Uh, Venny Gore, thanks so much. Uh, we're so excited that you're going to be able to welcome more kids back to school and back to the residence halls in the new semester. And we hope that it continues to go well. And uh, go green, grow white on Saturday. Go state. All right. Take care. Benny Gore, the Senior Vice President for Residential Housing there at Michigan State University. When we come back, the boss man, the president of the Michigan State University, uh, Dr. Samuel Stanley, joining us to talk about some of the challenges facing higher learning institutions in terms of how COVID has hit their budgets and also their enrollment. We'll get to all of that with the president in just a moment. But first, and we'll get back to your calls on the other side of that. But first, here's Michael Stetz, WJR Traffic. <clears throat> That's a really good question, Susan. Uh, Susan wants to know who is guarding Sparty if the uh, if the marching band isn't uh, physically able to get together. That's a really. That's that's a really good question. Is that the tradition up there? Someone they try someone tries to steal Sparty, and the marching band has to uh, guard them. Yeah, em? yeah. We'll we'll have to we'll have to. You know that should be question number one for President Stanley. The hell with enrollment and and budgets <laughs> and that crap. We'll ask him who's guarding Sparty. Right, and then what do, do they have? Like, uh, does Michigan have like a pet Wolverine that they have to protect? Even though I think a Wolverine might protect itself. I don't see a whole lot of people. <clears throat> Yeah, they let that Wolverine out, and they find that they have less problem with social interaction and distancing. <laughs> Everybody will distance. <laughs> right. If there's if there's a too big of a group of people too close together, they'll just release a Wolverine. Yeah, or it will come out, see its shadow, and it's uh, it's you know one more year of not making it to the uh, to, to a bowl game. Right. <laughs> it's Wolverine's day. Uh It's it's funny because I, my father in law is a, just a dear man. He's eighty seven now, and he's struggling with some memory issues. But he still he he can still he still loves football. You know he may not be processing things as well as he used to, but he can still watch football and he understands what's going on. And he you know it's it's something we can do together that's really a lot of fun. And yeah, there, you find out with someone that's that elderly, you there are more and more things you can't do. Uh, but it's really cool. Uh, yeah, the things that I'm, we can. I mean, if it's something he's been watching his whole life, that might that might be something that circumvents. Yeah, a lot of those issues if it's so ingrained. Remind me that you know when I come back from Steve Doolin at four thirty-five to make sure we promote the uh, War of the Worlds. Okay, on the air or just on this? No, definitely on the air. Let's we'll talk a little bit about it and just then get to calls. Right. It's funny because I've spent a lot of the day today um, letting people, because a lot of people are like, oh, we'll be we'll be tuned in to 760 at uh, at 730. And uh, right now it's 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 only on our Facebook YouTube page and at WJR.com slash War of the Worlds. Uh, if it goes well, it may re-air. But as of right now, it's a it's a it's an online only thing. Did you rehearse the? I mean, rehearse. Did you research the history of this? I mean, when when Wells did it back in '39, you know, there's the thing that people were jumping out of windows and all that malarkey. Um, was that yeah. true or? I read, I read that um, there was some of that, but it's been exaggerated over time. Most people knew, most people knew that it was um, fiction, but I think. I think like everything else, the few who fell for it were the ones who got the headlines. And over right. over time, it just, uh, you know, went from a few a few people who joined late um, to, you know, there was a whole population thinking that the uh, that, that the aliens were coming. Well, that's like the, it's an apocryphal story that there were brokers jumping out of the windows on Wall Street on the day that the market crashed back in right. 2029. Absolutely untrue. No one. Not one. It was not raining brokers on Wall Street. <laughs> well, that's good. That's a horrific vision. I, should... I know. Now, you say your dad's going to be tuning in. Your dad was what? He you... was He was thir- 
13 years old, 14 so he, years old, when did, when because he was born in 25. Yeah, so he's 14 years old. Did he hear it as it happened? I don't think you, you know, it's no, he's got the memory issues too. I don't think he remembers. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say it'd be interesting to see um, what he remembers of that, but. But yeah, from from what I've heard, that it was uh, it's a legend that that kind of kind of grew with time. Uh, remind me when we get to uh, Steve Doolin. I want to start with Nestle's cut fifteen. Doolin cut fifteen. Yeah. Okay. All right. Did you okay, get a chance to? Sure. Did you get a chance to listen to that John James ad? I did. Um, yeah. It. it, it Sounded like uh, it sounded like a pure Michigan egg, except yeah. for John James. If I was I, travel I, Michigan, I might be a little hacked off that you, you're stealing my uh, my you know my campaign theme. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the only thing that they used was the voice, but Tim Allen's voice is so synonymous with that ad campaign. Yeah, and I I I edited the Jeff Daniels one down. It was two minutes. I edited it down to the thirty. It's got the juicy parts everyone's talking about in okay. it. Good, so. good. Yeah, I, I mean, Jeff's got oodles of credibility, you know. Whether it's, um, I mean, he was. Well, what? I guess it depends. If you remember, if you remember him from the newsroom, he's got credibility. If you remember him from Dumb and Dumber, he doesn't have as much. Well, and the, <laughs> that's right. And maybe, maybe that's it. He's looking at polling and saying, "You say we got a chance." <laughs> One in 50,000. So you're saying we have a chance. Biden's got a nine-point lead, so you're saying we got a chance. <laughs> right. Right. I, we're going to need Jim Carrey to come in to break the, to, to break the gridlock. As Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, oh, yeah. I got. Yeah, you know what? I got a full circle. His Joe Biden, I mean, other than the fact he looks like Joe Biden. It's not like, that good. I mean, Alec Baldwin's Trump isn't really that good either, but at least at least he's putting on a voice. I mean, um, you know, it, uh, Jim Carrey. I mean, yeah, he looks like him, but anyone could look like him with with that makeup on. Yeah, I just and I'm not a huge Jim Carrey fan to begin with, but I yeah, I don't I don't think he's that good. I think that there was a moment in the debate where I swear I felt like Trump was doing Alec ba Alec Baldwin doing Trump. <laughs> That he he kind of fell into a parody of his own, really. I mean, weird, wild gestures and yeah. affectations that were so extreme. You're going, you're you're doing a parody, right? Of you're yourself. doing the bit. Yeah, it's kind of a bummer for SNL too. It, it seems like more and more they're bringing in, uh, you know, these these guest celebrities to do these. And, impressions they don't even have like their own cast members in their opening bits anymore you got yeah. maya rudolph as kamala harris you've got um baldwin as trump and you got carrie as uh, biden it's like they used to do all that stuff in house uh mark just said that you know polling is unknown nowadays it's interesting so our friends at um, Glenn Gariff Group just issued their poll that they do with the Detroit News and Channel 4. I don't think they've put the Trump Whitmer numbers out or Trump numbers out yet. But the one thing that was interesting, Whitmer has nearly 60 percent approval for her handling of COVID. Wow. And, and yet Trump is hammering her on her own turf. I don't know that that is a, a smart political strategy that you go after a popular governor and we know on this radio station there are fewer people that that might find her being popular but it is it is interesting okay so we're about 30 seconds away here there's no stanley yet by the way Probably allison if you are still with us if you want to send me any information on that that labor action you're talking about and i you know i know you probably don't want to talk about where you work but um Allison earlier was talking about the fact that nurses might go on strike November 5th about patient safety issues at hospitals. I'd love to learn more about that. Guy.Gordon at Cumulus.com is the best way to get a hold of me. Guy.Gordon at Cumulus.com. But let me All know right. what you and your labor so brothers guy, and sisters are next, doing on that. If our next guest isn't here yet, and I don't see him, uh, we'll go to Robert from Sterling Heights on the phone. Okay. So here we come. Let's see. Live in Detroit, this is Guy Gordon on News Talk 760 WJR.
This afternoon, Guy is on the 2020 College Tour, sponsored by Michigan State University. Visit them online at msu.edu. Here's Guy. So many virtues at Michigan State University, and we will get to to talking about those with the president of that fine institution of learning, Dr. Samuel Stanley. We're we're trying to connect with him right now. In the meantime, let's go back to our calls. And uh, Robert's in Sterling Heights. Robert, how you doing? Great. I I don't know if you heard, though. They did find those 500 belts. No, I didn't. It was in a Delaware repair shop, computer repair (laughs) shop, right next to Hunter's laptop. Then they won't report on it, right? On the laptop. Now the Russians are stealing ballots, too. Oh, my God. But on a uh, no more serious uh, note, Guy, this is the fourth time that this, th- these things have been overturned. First of all, you had the governor with uh, illegal executive orders. You had Cynthia Stevens overturning the election law. You had the governor saying there's a 21-day delay, and they overturned that. Now you had the secretary of state doing this, and the AG says she wants to have another court case on this. You're not going to get anyone to enforce it. Why do you want to solve problems that don't exist while there's problems you can't ex- that do exist that you have failed and you ignore? How many people have been cleaned up from the voter rolls? There's over 2,000 people that are dead in the voter rolls in Detroit alone. Right. And over 10,000 people that should have been taken off. She's not done one thing to take care of that problem. Well, that and she, be her, she can't that by, is her job. She can't by federal law within, what is it, within three months or more of an election. Now, she should have before, I agree. Correct. Um, but yeah, there, there, a lot of those, uh, dead or departed, meaning they've moved to other state, uh, voters, Mm -hmm. uh, we became aware of it when she sent out those applications for absentees and they were returned uh, by people that said, look, my kid doesn't live like me. My kid doesn't live here anymore. Please take him off the qualified voter roll, which we did. Uh, uh, but, uh, you, you, the other thing, Robert, in this is they claim that they're concerned about voter intimidation. But by constantly raising the issue, even without in the in the absence of a verifiable threat that someone's going to do something, a militia is going to show up at a polling place or anything like that, aren't they really scaring people? And aren't, aren't they in, in some ways the fear of voter intimidation is voter intimidation itself, and they end up creating the fear by continuing to talk about it. And I thought it was good today that they tried to reassure people, but I think it may be too late. And what I think the judge did say, and with the not the judge, but the, the people uh, bringing the case forward, did indicate that you shouldn't let people make a decision between their Second Amendment rights and their voting rights. And that's what she's doing. And that's the case that they brought to the judge, that you have to decide which one you want. And we should never have to decide that. We should be able to keep no. all of our rights, no matter what she says. And what's crazy is in their advidance, their, 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 ad, 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 what they were advising local law enforcement, We've got the, the Michigan State Police bulletin that they sent out to law enforcement. And by the way, this isn't supposed to be released to media, but we got a copy of it, thanks to a, a great source, where the Michigan State Police admit that's not violating the law, that this rule of hers was completely unenforceable. So, so many things. I just wish they would press pause and say, you know what, we're going to worry about securing this election and making sure that all the ballots are counted. In, and let's start by searching some bins in Detroit where apparently uh, the USPS has lost 500 ballots, uh, Robert. We'll, we'll see if they turn up in Delaware at a computer store. If they do, we know that NBC, ABC, and CBS will not be reporting on it. Only Fox. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Take care, Robert. Uh, Paul is, I, I, I think we lost Paul. Yes, let's go to Kelly in Waterford. Hi, Kelly. Kelly, are you there? Let's go to Dave from Howell. Let's do that. Let's go to Dave from Howell. Thank you, Michael. Dave is standing by in Howell with some thoughts on the voter Hi. rolls. Hey, well, Dave. thank you for t- thank you for taking my call, guy. I just wanted to make a comment regarding the the statement that uh, when the voter rolls are are being used to send out the uh, applications for the mail in and absentee voter ballots, the current Secretary of State is not using the current voting rolls to send those applications out. This is why. We're getting so many ballots that shouldn't be sent out. So my my spouse actually works in elections, and uh, this has kind of been a major complaint of hers, is that the Secretary of State is not using the current voter roll. So most of those people are taken off the, the rolls. It's just she's using something more than 10 years old uh, to send out to, to folks. So a lot of that 
error is self-inflicted. Yeah, and it's been interesting, Dave. I know there was a lot of concern when those those applications went out, and they were it was misreported that they were actual ballots, and the president tweeted about it incorrectly. But what's been interesting in the aftermath is how many applications for absentee that I've received from the Republican Party, from this group called the Center for Voter Information. Have you been spammed by them? Um, I have not. I have been spammed by them to say, hey, I haven't voted yet to, uh, yes. to get my absentee ballot. Yeah, yep. But, you know, those are political organizations where you would expect your secretary of state not to be engaged in the political process of it all, but but using the current voter rolls that would, would no question. in my opinion, the, the, the local clerks have done a fabulous job job uh, cleaning up those roles over time. I think Secretary Johnson did a wonderful role uh, in her in her role uh, cleaning up the roles, and then to eliminate all that work that these people have been doing for years to to somehow cast all this doubt on this election by ballots going out to so many people that shouldn't be getting them. And that's all I, I, I yeah, mean. And it, it, why, why wouldn't you the, use the, the best database that you have? I, I, right. I, it's just it leaves me scratching my head. Dave, uh, exactly. thanks to your wife for the work that she's doing. I know it's going to be the, uh, hell week next week, but we sure, sure appreciate it. Uh, as, as she works in the elections, uh, and I would imagine in, in a clerk's uh, office. You know what? I, I'm going to be hard up against a, a break here. Uh, one other thing that went out, and you can read about it in Bridge, Michigan, is this Center for Voter Information is now not just putting TV ads on telling you and shaming you into saying your neighbors will know if you don't vote, which is true if anybody actually took the time to look that kind of stuff up. But if is that not the dumbest get out the vote campaign that you ever heard of and it's i don't know about you but on social media it seems to be annoying the daylights out of people they hate it and yet they're still doing it and i don't know what voting group they think they're going to shame into voting for fear that a neighbor might be disappointed in them because they didn't vote we'll get back to your calls also hoping to connect with uh, president stanley on at uh, michigan state university we'll do that but first let's check in with michael stetz wgr traffic first Thank you very much, Guy. WGR Traffic First, sponsored by North Bloomfield Properties. If you're looking for a place to call home, let North- So did we lose President Stanley, and is he with the 500 ballots from Detroit? Just asking. He wasn't supposed to come through the mail, thank God. Um, we can go right now. All right, yeah, so our 405 is now at 435. Well, there you go. Yes. Hold on just a second. What? He stood us up? Are you telling me the president of the university had something better to do than to talk with us? No, I think I think we mixed up the times. Oh, I'm not exactly okay. sure. Just a second. I think he's got enough on his plate. All right, so we still got Steve coming up at 418, correct? Yes, as far as I know. All right, for those of you that are watching on Facebook, we're going to talk with the attorney that led – the battle to get the Benson gun ban overturned um, and, uh, and find out exactly from him what this means and what whether he's worried about this this appeal. And I'm also kind of interested to know, Michael, now that the gun groups have won, if maybe it isn't time for them to send out ni- a nice little missive to their friends that say, hey, you know, you might normally open carry, but in, in, in out of a sensitivity to people and creating a, a welcoming environment at polls, Maybe maybe election day isn't the best day to do it. Would that be? I mean, I I'd love to see them do that because there's no reason for them to prove the point. The point's already been proven. Right. And I mean, most and most people who who are open carry advocates, you know, they 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 have no interest in flashing in flashing an open firearm around just to look like you know they they're they're usually very responsible and are, are not a fan of uh, the idea of people flashing a, a gun around just to intimidate people so oh someone says that i am fox news in sheep's clothing i don't wear wool just for the record it 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 makes me itch i'm still trying to figure out why would you say that because i what am saying that it's a dumb thing to try to abridge people's second amendment rights on election day 
I don't think that's a Fox News point. I'm just saying the, the, the Constitution, state Constitution says that. I don't want people bringing guns to the polling places. I think that would be a stupid thing to do. I think that would turn more people against responsible gun owners. But that doesn't mean you ignore the Constitution or you love a, an elected official to go outside their lane. I don't think that's being Fox News. I think it's tell, telling them they gotta they got to follow the law. Let's see here. All right, so we are calling Steve Doolin. He should be there shortly. Okay. And you're going to want me to – you want me to come in with 15? Cut 15? Yeah. That'd be okay. great. Thank you. Okay, great. How far out are we here? About a minute and a half. Okay. So I was going to, you know what? I'm still going to run and get something to drink. I'll be right back. Yeah, you got time. And we'll see if Guy's back on time. Mark, Michelle, thank you everyone for checking in. Glad to see you all. So we'll get back to more calls after, uh, after uh, in the last quarter hour there, so. Okay, back in a minute. The suspense is building. Oh, okay, he's back in plenty of time. All right, 45, we're back. Okay. Steve is there. So did you see one of the things that popped up on, I subscribe to a bunch of marketing and advertising newsletters. Panera Bread is going to start serving pizza. Are you a Panera Bread fan? I do. I do like the bacon turkey Bravo. Oh, their soups are great, you know, in a bread bowl. But I mean, it is just, it's All a right. it's waistline explosion waiting to happen. Maybe if they did it on a bagel. Here we come, 10 seconds. This is the Guy Gordon Show, 760 WJR, where Detroit comes to talk. Welcome back in. Uh, Mike, I want you to play Cut 15 for me here. Attorney General uh, Dana Nessel, this is her speaking about uh, defending the Secretary of State over this gun ban ruling. Irrespective of the outcome of that case, uh, the fact is we know that the polls will be safe and secure. Uh, we don't intend to have law enforcement at the polls. We don't usually do that. Uh, we're not going to do it this year, but they will be um, nearby in the event that there are any sorts of issues whatsoever. So in other words, there isn't any kind of verifiable threat, yet they're going to continue to have uh, law enforcement on speed dial, but she basically tipped her hand there that this was to calm some nerves. It was never in the face of something that they actually thought was going to happen. Nevertheless, they kicked a hornet's nest, and uh, one of the hornets is at the other end of our line. Steve Doolin represented uh, the uh, group Michigan Open Carry and the Coalition for Responsible Gun Ownership in their suit against Secretary of State Benson, basically telling her that she was outside of her lane. Steve, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Sorry for the snort while you were talking, but I've, I've never been called a hornet before. Many other things, but never a hornet. Well, you're not a murder hornet, okay? Well, let's make that clear right there. You're not one Thank of these you. bad bad Asian imports. Um, i I got to ask you, help me um, sort through what the judge said, because he really didn't argue it or decide it on Second Amendment lines, nor did he decide it uh, over, over her constitutional authority. So what was what was won here? What, well, what was one is we, we got what's called a temporary injunction, which means the judge ordered that the ban on open carry at the polls is unenforceable. Uh, now, the, the latest development, by the way, is uh, the attorney general, on behalf of all defendants, filed an appeal this morning. And 
my other, fellow Hornets and I are currently working <laughs> on a response that's due at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, so we're now at the Court of Appeals, a different court, the higher court, and uh, essentially arguing the same issues. Uh, but you're, you're right. This, this was not a Second Amendment case. This was really much more simple. Uh, it was about the fact that the Secretary of State took an action that is uh, what we call ultra virus, which is Latin for beyond her power. She simply doesn't have the uh, authority to uh, craft this pronouncement, is the word we've been using in our, our pleadings, uh, that purports to be an instruction but not a rule. Mm-hmm. Uh if she makes a rule, she's got to go through a whole process called the APA, the Administrative Procedures Act. And it, they've admitted they, that they didn't do that, uh, but they say it's okay because there's a subsection to one of the statutes that allows for uh, what's called permissive authority, which means that uh, the Secretary of State can choose to not exercise her authority. And uh, that didn't make a lot of sense to the judge. It didn't make any sense to us at all, and we pointed it out, and the judge agreed with us. Okay, so going forward, I mean, uh, obviously they, they said they were going to appeal. I don't know how valuable that is going to be. If you've won on the grounds, are it, it, at what point do you think the, the Michigan Open Carry and the Coalition for Responsible Gun Owners will say, look, uh, this, was never, this was never our battle. We're not fighting for the right to carry in the polling places, but if it's challenged, we must stand up for it. Will they say once they win this case, and I believe that they'll prevail on appeal, look, folks, we are not encouraging this, and we would ask you in the interest of all maybe to reconsider whether or not you would do it. Do you think that will tell you a wise thing uh, to do? I'm not even going to comment on that because I'm in the middle of this fight and because we've got an alliance right now of three different groups that are governed by three different right. boards of directors. Uh, and, you know, the, and by the way, the other group is called Michigan Gun Owners, and we are all on the same side of this uh, because we all agree that this is just part of an effort to demonize guns and gun owners mm-hmm. uh, and uh, that it's uh, beyond the power of the Secretary of State. Uh, you know, I mean, the main thing that caught my attention early on is that it, that it was a surprise. There was just this announcement because if there had been a pending rule, I certainly would have known about it, and we would have weighed in. We, there's a time for public comment. We would have had a chance to do that. And there's certainly nothing from the legislature. So um, the, the, the one thing we all agree on at this moment on this side of the table is that um, this uh, never should have been ordered uh, the way it was. And regarding the you know wisdom of the policy moving forward, the judge even said yesterday, boy, if you guys wanted – he said to the, to the attorney general's uh, uh, attorney – uh, if you guys wanted to do this, you could have started months ago. Right. You could have gone through the administrative process that, that would have permitted you to do this. Do you think that they could have gotten away with that? Could, could an administrative rule like that check a Second Amendment right? I actually don't think so. Um, and in fact, you know, one of the things I said yesterday during the oral argument is, uh, you know, my position on this public policy issue is well known. However, I'm not going to argue it here. It's the wrong forum. This is to be argued in and by the legislature. Right. Um, interesting. So I got hold of a, situ- a situational awareness bulletin that the Michigan State Police and the, the Michigan Intelligence Operations Center sent out. And it's interesting in that they, they say it could happen, but at no time does the Michigan State Police say that they have intelligence that it's going to happen or that somebody is even planning it or talking about it uh, where they might have human intel, Right. So when, when you got into your arguments with the AG, did they say that they had any kind of verifiable threat that led them to take this extraordinary step in the first place? Or is it just no, trying they, to calm fears from maybe some, I, I hate to call them nervous Nellies, but I'll, I'll let it stand. No, I'll say that, you know, they included um, some uh, affidavits and for technical reasons, we, we don't uh, accept all those filings because they, they weren't... Uh, done according to proper procedure either, but essentially a bunch of letters from about 20 people who said that uh, they get scared. Uh, And that's not the way you make policy. You don't find 20 people who have a particular sensitivity on any issue and then make statewide policy. Well, it, it, this this is true. I, Attorney General Nessel was quite confident that we'll have this reconciled before Election Day. Do you think we'll know before we get to the weekend? 
Uh, I, I, well, we're, we're at court of appeals right now. There's another level above that. Uh, and honestly, we've still got a pending action at the, the initial court, the trial court, the court of claims, because the appeal is just on the preliminary order invalidating the pronouncement of the secretary of state. We still have our underlying, uh, action for a declaratory judgment. It's still pending at court of claims. This is what you call an interlocutory appeal, right. which means we run up to the higher court to solve this issue, and then we can go back to the lower court, and we could end up with an appeal of this interlocutory appeal at the Supreme Court. So we're just taking it step by step. All right. Steve Doolin, thanks for keeping us up to date on uh, what has happened here. And I hope that once the, the legal rights are protected, that the, the folks in those groups will say, hey, you know what, let's make sure that we don't give a re- people a reason to fear us or to resent us uh, on Election Day. Thanks so much, and we appreciate your time, Steve. Well, I do want to say just, just briefly, I'm sure that I speak for all three boards when I say that we all are against voter intimidation and anything that would be criminal under current law. We all want there to be nice, peaceful process during voting right i know you do and this and i appreciate that steve thanks so much but i, I would thanks hope it would even go so far as to encourage folks that maybe this wouldn't be the best day uh to open carry if, if they didn't have to thanks so much and uh inc- incidentally and we hope to c- connect with the naacp but they are now saying that they're going to have an army of poll watchers keeping tabs on polling places it's unclear whether this is going to be a credentialed group of 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 poll watchers or if this is going to be an ad hoc group providing security uh, from the civil rights organization. And we'll we'll hopefully connect with Reverend Anthony about that to get some clarification about what they're going to be doing. But uh, they claimed it was because the president said to the Proud Boys, what was it, stand by and, you know, well, that's how they're interpreting that as a threat at the polls. Uh, When we come back, the president of Michigan State University, uh, Dr. Samuel Stanley. But first, let's get to Michael Stett's WJR Traffic First. In the city, the off-ramp closed right now until further notice on 94 eastbound at Michigan Avenue due to a train derailment this morning. Once equipment arrives, 94 expected to be closed in both directions there. Avoid the area if you can. In Monroe County, an accident on 75 southbound at Luna Pier Road. You're stop and go from Otter Creek. And in Oakland County, you're slowly moving on 75 southbound right now between 696 and 9 Mile. Now WJR weather first. From the Weather Channel, sponsored by Gordon Chevrolet. Gordon Chevrolet is back selling the hottest vehicles in town. Pull ahead your lease and take advantage of zero interest for up to 84 months or sign and drive lease program. Open special hours this Saturday, 9 to 3. Ford Road, just west of Merriman in Garden City. GordonChevrolet.com. Gordon Chevrolet. Find new roads. Cloudy with a low around 40 degrees tonight. And now it's 53 degrees. I'm Michael Stetz, WJR News in one minute. All right, now we're on Stanley Watch here for 435. Right. All right, I got some things I got to do, so I'm going to put Kenny up here on the stream here. Okay. So is are, is Kenny using um, our studio? Kenny Rogalski. Oh, Kenny Rogalski. I was thinking Kenny Brown. Oh no 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 not Kenny Brown no. <laughs> no, he's getting ready for album I think. Well, have they have they disconnected the control board in Frank's studio? No, not yet. We're okay. still we're still waiting on that. So it's like swimming in. Uh, Ashley, Mindy. Um, wow, we got a lot of swimmers and divers out there. And Michelle, uh, thanks for your questions. And I'm going to do my best to ask him about that. That was not on my radar and um, appreciate it. 
Yeah, I heard about. Yeah, I heard. Well, I don't want to speak for anyone. I, it's, I heard it was a uh, just a budget thing. Yeah, I. Uh, it's too bad because somebody. I mean, I know that both programs were were good. Many statements might be are inaccurate, particularly that the team does not swim in a regulation pool. Really? I don't know. Are are Ashley are, are and and Mindy are you guys? Um, wow, Anne, we got five of you here. Are you guys all former swimmers? Thanks, Ray. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, uh, he should be joining us any minute here. A lot of passionate folks. Okay. Well, good for you guys. Do you think there's any chance, uh, ladies, to restore the swimming program? See, that's what I'm wondering. Once sort of things go back to normal and wow. when it gets to once uh, there's money back in the coffers, Thanks, Mindy. I'm, I'm guessing a lot of these are going to be coming back. I got to tell you, this is the first show we've done where our commenters and our folks on Facebook have been really integral parts in making sure that we get. Uh, I mean, it's it's fun to have you guys on there and, and filling us in. That's terrific. Okay, let's see. Hold on. Oh. Okay, as soon as we're done with the news here, I'll pop. Uh, President Stanley up there, and we can check his uh, check his sound. We got a bunch of swimmers in our family, but they swam for uh, Miami of Ohio. Um, I think. Oh, my my uh, brother-in-law was U of D, and my my nephew uh, was at Emory. Swam for Emory. Wow, all over the map. All right, we should be out of news here in a second. All right, any second. All right, President Stanley, thanks for joining us. Can you hear us, and can we hear you? I can hear you. We got you as well. Great. Well, I, I, I've, I've got my green on for you. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Stanley. Yeah, I, I didn't actually do as well myself. I do have a green tie. so. Well, you have to save your stuff for the weekend, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So somebody asked me, who is uh, – Who's guarding Sparty these days? Because I know you 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 don't have as many as students on campus. There's always enough volunteers, I think. To do okay, that. good. Uh, we want to make I've sure seen, that's. I've seen a number of people when I've ridden around there uh, are out there, so uh, they're very dedicated and they don't want anything to happen. Even in the time of COVID nineteen, they're going to stand out there and, and, and protect them. It's good to know that that kind of vigilance uh, isn't going to be uh, scared away by a virus. Um, can I also ask you a question as an MD uh, sure, uh, and a, as a specialist about what, what, what we're in right now? Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll wait till we get into the uh, to the show here. But, yeah, sure. very curious uh, about the um, your take on what we're witnessing. You know, the hospitalizations I know have tripled, and yet we're still at about 25% of what the peak hospitalizations were. So I guess, you know, and, and the short the stays are a little bit shorter and things like that, whether we're in a better position now, or whether we should be more worried and, you know, where that trip line is on, on, on locking down. We had a great conversation with uh, Venny Gore that you're going to be able to bring 2,600 more kids back in the next semester to the residence halls. That's great news. Yeah, we're excited about that. 
Um, I think uh, we've had extraordinary success um, with, you know, the, with decreasing the damage. Oh. Oh. Back in uh, five seconds here, gentlemen. Okay. okay. Welcome back to more Guy Gordon on WJR. Today, Guy is sponsored by Michigan State University. Visit them online at msu.edu. Once again on his 2020 college tour, here's Guy Gordon. And we're wrapping up the college tour, an abbreviated one because of COVID-19, but we're wrapping it up at one of our favorite schools. Of course, uh, we are the home of Michigan State football. And we welcome in Dr. Samuel Stanley, the fine president of Michigan State University. I think you're 15th. 15 month anniversary is a couple days from now. Am I correct? That's absolutely right, guy. You, you you've nailed it. 15 does it, months. Yeah. Does it feel like the shortest honeymoon on record, or does it just seem that way? Yeah, I don't think there was a honeymoon. <laughs> honestly, um, I, I've dropped right in it, and um, but it's an amazing institution, and I'm, I'm so proud to be a part of it. And uh, with all the challenges we faced, I think we've worked very hard as an institution to meet them together. And I think that continues. Well, no question. And I think, you know, of all the things that you came in knowing about that had to be addressed, a, a pandemic was not one of them. And so I've got to ask you to put your uh, your infectious disease hat on, on for me. Help me assess where we are right now. I know that hospitalizations have tripled, yet far off the peak that we that we saw them. Um, what would be your assessment? Uh, I heard from the, one of the, the president's uh, task force members today that called our situation tenuous. How would you describe it? Well, I'm very concerned. And uh, I think as you look around the country and see the number of states that are hitting record highs or coming close to record highs in terms of new cases, um, it's concerning. And I think, you know, we've done somewhat better, as you pointed out. Uh, some of that is because a lot more of the outbreak, I think, for at least the past few months has been in the lower age groups where the mortality and morbidity are much less. So in other words, right. people just don't get as sick. So that's made a difference. But I think now as more ages are being affected, I think we are going to see that increase in hospitalizations. I do think we've done better at learning how to manage within the hospital. So I think because of some of the drugs that may be available, as well as how people manage people without ventilators and keep them off ventilators, I think we're going to see a decrease again in morbidity, mortality, how people get, how, pe how much people get sick. But I'm very concerned because the more cases we have, um, the more hospitalizations, the more deaths ultimately we will have. And so I think it, you know, there has to be more centralized action that needs to be taken on this. And that's an, an issue for another time and place. And, right. But I think it's, it's, we're, it's challenging. I, and I think you're right to be concerned, Guy. And I think uh, the, the nation is right to be concerned. Yeah, as, as we look ahead, um, we, we know that businesses have seen their balance sheets blown apart. Uh, cities certainly have in terms of their budgets, the unanticipated costs in addressing COVID. You're running something that is both a business and a small city. Uh, I would bet it's it's kind of a double whammy. Are what do we do? How are you doing with your balance sheet? And are we going to need some additional help from the legislature? And and just give us a quick uh, status report, if you would, please. So it's so a great question, Guy. And I, I think we're managing well, all things considered. Um, we did see a small drop in enrollment, about one point six percent or so in enrollment. Um, but I think where we took a hit in that was in our international students, obviously, who had difficulty getting visas and therefore coming to the U.S. to study. So our first year international class is where we saw the most uh, damage in terms of enrollment, in terms of those numbers. Um, the state allocation, actually, this year we were very pleased uh, that the state kept our allocation the same. We're actually very grateful to the governor and to both houses um, for supporting that because um, we had anticipated in our budget potentially a cut in state allocation given what we thought might be a decline in tax revenues to the state. So I think where we've seen the most impact right now, Guy, is one in our housing system. Mm -hmm. We did reduce the number of students in housing. And so while we can, we also did reduce some of the people working there to account for that, we can't fully account for that in those kind of reductions. So there's significant losses there. And then again, athletics um, has had some losses as well um, associated with the fewer number of games being played uh, in football uh, and other and the cancellation last year, actually, of the men's basketball tournament. Those things definitely had an impact on the bottom line of athletics. So I think we're managing. Um, we would always appreciate more help from the legislature. I think one of the things we're really proud of is what we've been doing to help the state during this time. Michigan State is an institution and our sister institutions in Michigan have been doing a number of things 
during COVID-19. Um, we're doing ways to better test for the novel coronavirus. We've done things to novelly decontaminate personal protective equipment. And we've been investigating therapies. And some of the work on convalescent serum has been coordinated through Michigan State. So yeah. I think we're doing all of these kinds of things. And, and you know, to the extent it helps us, I would love more money from the legislature. But I do understand the constraints they were under this year. So I, I've got to tell you, and I, I don't want to blindside you with this, but while we've been talking, the Facebook side of our broadcast has been blowing up with a lot of very proud Spartan alums who are also former swimmers and divers, and they want to know if there's any chance that that program could possibly be saved or resurrected at some point in the future. So I, I think, you know, what, what was communicated by our athletic director, Bill Beekman, I think stands on an extraordinarily difficult decision uh, one that was precipitated to some degree by COVID-19, but really reflects a challenge we've had with the program for a number of years. Um, I think the swimmers have been some of our best student athletes, and I really understand um, the, the, the really how profoundly disappointed they must be by this decision. But if you look at what our ability to compete in the Big Ten at a level that I think is, is appropriate, if you look at the facilities we have, which right now in these tough budget times, we don't have the ability to upgrade, um, I think it becomes a difficult, it became a difficult decision but one I think that makes sense. Well, I'll tell you, they are passionate. Uh, we're certainly seeing that on our, on our feed right now. Hey, big game, obviously, coming up this Saturday. I understand that Sparty is still being protected, even in, uh, even in COVID-19 times. Uh, I, I know that th these are exciting times, but uh, you want to encourage folks to be safe at the same time. Absolutely. And, and I think, again, I think uh, on campus, it's been it was very successful when we had the game uh, last week. We did have some issues off campus. Um, where some people really were not following the rules about gatherings, particularly, or wearing masks, both of which, are, you know, are really critical in maintaining health. And so I hope this week, you know, we'll have a chance to to do it right. And so I, I you know, like everybody else, I can't wait to watch Spartan football. I had a mm -hmm. great time enjoying it. Uh, and I'm listening to the radio as well, of course. I'm listening to you, you all. Um, you know, that, that's exciting. But I think, again, we've got to be very careful about these gatherings. Hopefully, if there's more, more disease in the community. I certainly appreciate it, and we know that folks will exercise uh, responsibility when it comes to getting together. Uh, fewer people just cheer louder. I think that's the what we, what we need to do, right? Yeah, or, or cheer through that mask, too. So, there yeah, you go. Too. Dr. Stanley, thank you so much. We sure appreciate it. Enjoy uh, Saturday's game, and uh, I, I, I know it'll be a good one. Uh, when we come back, more of your calls on News Talk 760 WJR 1 800 859 Let's get to Michael Stetz, WJR Traffic First, as our campus tour continues. In Monroe County, an accident on 75 southbound at Luna Pier Road. That has you stop and go from La Pleasance Road. In Port Huron, delays up to 30 minutes for trucks right now on the Blue Water Bridge heading eastbound. And in Oakland County, you're moving slowly right now on 75 northbound between 9 Mile and 14 Mile. Not WJR weather first from the Weather Channel. Yeah, no guys, sorry, I couldn't get more you, than that. And Marathon can improve your engine performance with quality. You know, that's, that's probably, for, again, for another time, but... The politics involved in this and the underwriting and the endowments and the fellowships and all that stuff, maybe if we could get, you know, put together a, you know, uh, an alumni group that could raise money and get their attention. Uh, but it's a shame that you would lose a program like that. But then I, you know, I, I've seen the same thing up at my alma mater. We lost the tennis team. We lost, which is a, one of my best buddies was a, was a tennis player up there. You know, uh, there are, there, these are cuts that are being made everywhere. And some of it, too, does come down to state support. Um, we have seen support for higher learning from the state budgets cut and cut and cut again. And they know that they, they yeah, can't I, rely. Yeah. Dr. Stanley is still here, so I'm going to bring him up. I don't know if he would like to fact or contribute to this. Yeah, He is just, nodding along with you. Yeah, I, we've got, I'm just getting hit. We've got a huge feed here, Dr. Stanley, with folks that say that, you know, that they were leaders with GPA. They were leaders in a lot of ways, and they just are, are yeah. so frustrated. Well, I, I think I'm, I'm, I've got to go, actually, at 445. So I understand. I, I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything else we needed to cover before. No, there was nothing else. It's just, yeah. I, as I said, I'm, I'm talking back and forth with my friends on Facebook here who are, uh, who are commenting and streaming. Got a lot, it. Of, got lot it. of passion there. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day on Saturday. Thank you. Uh, Let's let's hope so. Yeah. 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 The coach will get it together. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. So, guy, we still have George in Northville. Guy. Yeah, hold on a second. Just hold on a second. Okay, we got some other stuff we can talk about, too. You also wanted me to remind you to promote War of the Worlds. Right. Will we be on the Facebook page as well? Will people be able to? Okay. Yeah, Facebook and YouTube. Okay. okay, let's see when will our out be. Okay, let's see, our out will be 50. 5620. 5620. Good Lord, somebody must have put out a massive crew call here. We've got every swimmer of the past 25 years here on our feet. Oh my goodness. Okay, let's see here. Traffic 5620. Oh, 5750. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we've got George from Northville. Is that what you said, Laura? Yeah, George from Northville. Yeah, he's still there. Okay. And we still have those still have those two ads, the celebrity ads. Yeah. Uh, let's, by all means, do something with that. Ooh. All right. All right, back in a minute here. I I wish I had known that the uh, that President Stanley was still uh, in the in the green room there. I I I don't think I said anything that I I would have offended him, but I. Uh, yeah, I was doing the traffic and the weather. I didn't. Until I looked down, I saw he was still there, so we figured we'd pop him back in. Well, I was talking with our friends on uh, on Facebook, and uh, he must have been. I didn't know that he could overhear that. All right, back in fifteen here. Okay, but maybe it's just as well too. Um, you know, and it's. The stories that have been breaking while you've been at work. 760 WJR, where Detroit comes to talk. So, uh, good to have you back in here. By the way, something was interesting, was, I think it was Tuesday, uh, that the president tweeted out something about the fact that Google, how do I change my vote, was trending very high on Google. And the fact is, uh, if you do want to change your vote and you have already voted, you can do that in the state of Michigan, but time is running out. The deadline to do so by mail uh, is 5 p.m. on Friday, October 30th. Now, you can also apparently spoil your ballot uh, anytime by going to the clerk's office before 10 a.m. on Monday. Uh, So if for some reason the president was doing this because he saw that this was trending on Google and he thought... His interpretation was more people wanted to change their vote to Donald Trump from Joe Biden after the debate. I don't know what, why it was trending, but it was. And the question is, the the, the answer is you can still do that, but time is running out to do it here in the state of Michigan. We should tell you that 53,000 ballots have been spoiled so far in Michigan. This is according to our friends at MLive. Uh, but they haven't been spoiled because people are changing their minds. At least that's not according to the uh, the Secretary of State's office. Uh, in many cases, those those ballots were spoiled because they were printed incorrectly. So this would be in maybe smaller jurisdictions where they made a boo-boo on the ballot, and now they've had to tell people uh, that they are uh, 
that their ballot was spoiled. In the meantime, a kind of a cool thing happening, and that is the um, uh, Imagine Theaters is going to be having a, uh, a watch party for the Michigan-Michigan State game. And it's going to be, uh, as every presentation they have at the theater, and this is at the Macomb, Palladium, Saline, Rochester Hills, and Royal Oak, also Imagine Canton. Um, right now it's free to attend, and it's going to be on a first-come, first-served basis, but they're going to be put, putting the big game on their big screens uh, on Saturday beginning at noon. They're going to open up 30 minutes prior to the game start time. Uh, they've got food and drink specials there, uh, but – you can still kind of get into the spirit of having a watch party, which is socially distanced. Then they're going to make sure that if you sit, you sit in pods with people you know. Uh, but you can get involved in that uh, if you'd like. In the meantime, as we approach Election Day, some uh, big-time celebrity talent is coming out to support their respective candidates. We know that Tim Allen is a die-in-the-wool conservative. Uh, He has uh, been very vocal on conservative uh, matters in the past, and he has now cut a spot uh, for John James, the U.S. Senate candidate facing off against incumbent Gary Peters. And I want you to listen to it. Uh, Mike's got a a quick cut for us. Give us a sample, Mike. Michigan, a place where people respect each other, love each other. Michigan, that's John James. James defending our country, offering a healing hand, creating jobs that matter, doing the job that really matters. Grounded in real life, that's John James. I'm John James. I approve this act. And I guess John James is pure Michigan. Uh, I Actually, I find it effective. I don't know that people that appreciate kind of hijacking the travel Michigan theme would be, uh, you know, or, or the, the format. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, the guy that, of course, uh, is on the other side of the spectrum, Jeff Daniels, Chelsea Bourne, uh, of course, uh, did a great job as Will McAvoy on the newsroom. He's played Atticus Finch, these very weighty, uh, highly ethical characters on television. He has cut his spot. For Joe Biden. Take a listen to that. Here in Michigan, we don't believe in paying off porn stars to keep their mouths shut about who we really are. And we don't think much of a man who disrespects women. In fact, we don't think he's much of a man at all. I'm Jeff Daniels. I grew up in Michigan. Lived here most of my life. Still do. I voted for Joe Biden. An ominous cello there in the background, very different in tone, very ominous, and uh, and Jeff making his pitch for Joe Biden. So dueling homegrown celebrities uh, that you'll be hearing in the closing days of the uh, of the election. Um, we do have a, a, a Detroit News uh, WDIB poll showing that uh, John James had been closing. Uh, the gap between he and Gary Peters, and recently uh, the Gary Peters has been widening that gap just in the in the closing days because of the spots where Peters basically just keeps marrying John James to Donald Trump, uh, that he was, quote, unquote, 2,000 percent behind him. Those ads apparently seem to be uh, damaging uh, the uh, the challenger in this case, uh, John James. But we also know that the polls have been all over the place, and they uh, certainly it's no exception in this election. And so many people that have just found them to be uh, dubious and are skeptical about them. Uh, You guys, we've talked about this before. Are you pleased, as Laura scrambles for her headsets, are you pleased with your dishwasher? (laughs) Wow, what a hard-hitting question. I know. Uh, yeah, I I guess it's something I've given zero thought to. So I guess if I don't have an issue, I guess I'm pleased with it. Okay, because they changed the regulations for dishwashers several years ago. And as a result, they run for a longer period of time and they are just not as efficient. And it's all about saving water. It's all about saving time and, and you know, trying to save energy as well. But it makes the dishes less clean. And mm. 
and and I don't know if you've gone through this at all, Laura, but here's the good news. And this is why not every election is about weighty issues. But when you talk about overregulation and silly regulations, American homes have been stuck with dishwashers that stink now for several years. And a rule change that was championed by the Trump administration has been accepted by the Department of Energy and has gone forward so that they can change the design of dishwashers so that they don't have to run two and a half hours in order to save water. That they're going to use a little bit more water, but they're going to be more efficient and possibly won't use so much power. Something happened with that with toilets a couple decades back. The they low flush to- toilets. Right. That, you know, from a design standpoint, I think they've managed to work some of that out. But uh, the dishwasher thing has just been a niggling problem. Well, those those regulations have now changed, and hopefully we will all get cleaner dishes and less hassles. It shows how little regulations, little priority changes can make a big difference, though they're not the big issues. They still make a difference. Uh, we'll be back to do it all over again tomorrow. We thank you for being with us. We thank uh, Michigan State University for uh, sponsoring today's broadcast and being part of our uh, WJR College tour. We'll see you tomorrow at 3. Until then, take care. Here's Michael Stats. All right, guy. We'll see you for War of the Worlds in a few hours. Yes, sir. 730 right here. All right.